영어 문서 읽기 500번 읽기 챕터 7부터 마지막까지 또 이어서 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. 17번째 읽기 버니큘라 챕터 7 A new friends in need In the days that followed, c h e t t e r s behavior was exemplary. He purred and he could, he cleaned his paws, and he rubbed up against everyone's legs to show what a good boy he was. I was getting worried. c h e t t e r acts that way only when he has something devious in his mind, in the back of his mind. But I didn't know what it was. He had tried everything in the book to get rid of vampires. and all his efforts had failed. But I knew from the expression on his face that something was definitely up. Of course, I didn't know per certain because he had not spoken to me since the stake incident. I guess I realized that my heart just went in the destruction of the burning vampire. In fact, I was beginning to like the little fellow. The m o l o s who was beginning to The Molos were relieved by Chester's improved behavior. They didn't know how to account for his strange doings, but to their credit, they were willing to let bygones be bygones. The only disturbing factor in all our lives was the reappearance of the white vegetable. Each morning in the kitchen, and yet after a few days, even they stopped and the life seemed to return to normal. One evening, I dropped by b e n i c u l a s cage to chat. I'd found myself doing them more and more since c h e t t e r had stopped talking to me. Of course, b u n i c l a didn't talk back, but he was a good listener. I'd begun to think of him as a friend, a strange one, granted, but one cat always choose one's friends. I was distressed this particular evening to see that he was dragging his ears, as it were. He looked tired and listless. I p e r t e d his nose, and it seemed a little warmer than it should have been. I became alarmed. I ran over to Toby, who was doing a picture p u t on the floor, and began to bark. Something I do only in cases of extreme emergency, since even I do not care for the stunt. What matters, Harold? Toby asked without moving. Are there burglars? I ran to the cage and looked at b u n i c u l a I looked back at Toby and whimpered. Toby just looked confused. Do you want to play with b u n i c u l a Shall I take him out of the cage? Woof! I responded, indicating I hoped that that was indeed what he should do. I'll ask mom and dad Harold. You wait here. He was back in a minute, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Harold, but mom said you can't play with the rabbit. It, because it caused too much commotion. I looked down at the floor and whimpered again. Sorry, Harold. Maybe later, when we, all, we are all in here together. I regarded the panicula whose eyes were mine. He gave a little shudder, and I felt like a crime. My friend was sick, and I didn't know what to do. I wish that I could tell Chatter, but I knew it was no use. He was just a two men. I would have to salt this one out of my own. Then I couldn't sleep, worrying about the bunicula. I decided to go downstairs and check on this his condition. What I saw when I entered the living room horrified me. b u n i c u l a was out of his cage on the floor, while c h e t t e r stood in front of him, with a piece of garlic around his neck and his arms outstretched, blocking the kitchen door. Suddenly, it all fell into place. c h e t t e r was a starving b u n i c u l a Of course, that's why he seemed so listless, and that's why the v e g e t a b l e s had stopped turning white. c h e t t e r had made it impossible for b u n i c u l a to eat. Chester, I cried. Chester jumped a very high jump. What are you doing down here? He spat at me as he ran in. I knew what he was doing, Chester, and the jig is up. The little bunny never hurt anybody. All he's doing is eating his own way. What do you care if he drains a few vegetables? He's a vampire, Chester snarled. Today, vegetables. Tomorrow, the world. I think perhaps you are overestimating your case, I suggested cautiously. Go back to bed, Harold. This is rather than the two of us. It may seem harsh, but I'm only being cruel to be kind. Who's he being kind to? I wondered as I went back upstairs. The tomatoes and the chickens of the world? Maybe a few cabbages? It just didn't make sense. But I could see I wasn't going to get anywhere with the chatters tonight. Tomorrow, however, would be another story, and I was determined that by hook or by crook, 
my friend Bunicula would eat by sundown the next day. Chapter 8 The Jester in the Dining Room I realized that there was nothing I could do for Bunicula during the day since he was sleeping. But that gave me time to plan my strategy. At first, I thought I would bring food to his cave, but then it occurred to me that Chester must be taking everything away that was given to him. Pete and Toby usually left the letters for Bunicula during the day while he was sleeping, and Chester ever watched for. Probably nabbed at each evening just before the rabbit walk. No, there would have to be another way. <clears throat> I thought and thought all afternoon. And I could see that Chetter had done a good job of isolating Bonicula from his food. There was no way I could think of to overcome Chetter's game plan. As the evening drew closer and I grew more and more frantic, I stumbled into the dining room and saw the answer to my problems sitting before me on the table. It was a big ball of a salad. All I had to do was get Bonicula to the salad and to let him get his fill before the family came in to eat. With that funny white dressing on it, they would have never notice if a new vegetable were white. I ran to the hallway to check the clock, 6.15. It would be 15 minutes before the sun went down and the Bonicula woke up. I would then need at least 5 minutes to get him from his cage to the table and feed him. All I had to do was make sure no one came into the room until he had finished. I needed a good 20 minutes at least. I went back into the living room. Chetra was asleep on his brown velvet chair, shedding in his sleep, still worn out the previous night activities. I checked upstairs. Toby was already in his room. The rest of the chapter of the treasure and I knew it. Pete, who should have been been doing his homework, was listening to record in his room. I ran down to the kitchen. Hello, Harold, Mrs. Morton said it as I came through the door. What's new? Other than the rabbit starving in the next room and an imminent attack on your salad bowl, not, nothing, I thought. I stood at her feet and panted. He scr she scratched my head. This gave me a moment to check out how far she was in her cooking. Sorry, Harold, she said. I have to baste this chicken. I noticed the oven timer still had 35 minutes to go. It will be tight, I thought, but I can make it. Now, well, is the Mr. Monroe. I went to the front door and whimpered loudly. Mrs. Monroe followed me. Are you ready for Daddy Harold? <coughs> He'll be, he will be home soon. Soon is the good enough. How soon is the, I whimpered again? Patient boy, he's a latest school meeting. He should be here any time. She went back into the kitchen, and I checked the clock. 6.25. It was getting dark, and Chester was still asleep. Time to swing into action. Having watched, having watched Chester under the lock on the Bunnicola's cage, and having participated in that unfortunate take an episode some days earlier. I knew I would have no problem getting Bonicula out. I just had to be a little more careful where I positioned my head so that I wouldn't find myself in humiliating predicament of getting stuck a second time. My timing was perfect with Bonicula swimming peacefully from my teeth. I made my way stealthily toward the dining room as the last rays of the sunlight gave away to the dark of night. Once inside the dining room door, Bonicula awakened in great bewilderment. Bewilderment. It is. It is not every day after all that one finds oneself upon awakening, hanging from the jaws of a fellow creature, even so carrying a gentle a creature as myself. Bonicola opened his eyes wide and turned his face as best as could to me. I jumped up onto the nearer chair and placed the rabbit safely on the table's edge. Okay, I whispered. There's your dinner. Go to it. Get your fill as fast as you can. Poor Bunny, I was stand guard. I don't know that Bunicula fully understood what was going on, but the sight of the vitrops piled high in the center of the table sent him scurrying in their, in their direction. He was very hungry, as luck would have it, and as I should have anticipated, as the sense of timing was as astute as my own. No sooner had Bunicula reached the edge of the salad bowl than the door swung open and the chatter bounded into the room. He surveyed the scene frantically. I was unable to act fast enough. 
upon seeing when Nikola about the, to enjoy his first bit of nourishment in days, Chesa licked across the table, seemingly without touching floor chairs or anything else between himself and our furry friend, and landed directly on top of the bunny. Oh no, you don't, he shrieked. But Nikola, not sure what to do, jumped high in the air and landed with the greatest scattering of greens smack in the center of the salad wall. Lettuce and tomatoes and carrots and cucumbers went flying all over the table and onto the floor. Chetro flattened his ears, wiggled his rear end, and smiled in anticipation to cat observes. This is known as the attack position. Run, Bunnicula! I shouted. Bunnicula turned in my direction as if to ask where. Anywhere, I cried, just to get out of his way. Chetro sprang. Bunnicula jumped. And in the flash of a second, they had changed the positions. Chester now found himself flat on his back, owing to the slippery of the salad dressing in the bowl. And the panicula, too dazed to even think about food now, hovered quibbling on the table. Chester was having a great deal of difficulty getting back on his feet. But I knew it was only a matter of a second before he attacked again, and I knew also that Bonicula was too petrified to do anything to save himself, so I did the only thing I could. I barked, very loudly and very rapidly. The whole family rushed through the doors. Mr. Muller must have just come home because his coat was just gone. Oh no, cried Mrs. Muller, that's it, Chester, this is Chester's last stand. Chester rolled his eyes heavenward, and they didn't even try to move. Mom, said Toby, tugging at his mother's arm, look at Bonicula, how did he get out of his cage? He looked scaled. Of course he had scaled, Mrs. Murna said. We probably forget to latch his cage and he got out, and I think Chester has been chasing him. Toby put his face close to the rabbit. Mom, doesn't Bonicula look kinda sick? We'd better take them all to the vet to see if any damage was good if done. She answered. I started to whimper. No need for me to go to the vet. Mr. Murna patted my head. We may as well take Harold along, he said. He's probably due for his shot. Mrs. Murna carefully picked the chatter out of the salad bowl and carried him by the scruff of the neck to the kitchen. I'm going to give Chetra a quick bath. She said to Mr. Murnau, why did you put together a fresh salad? Tell me you and Peter put Bonicula back in his cage and then clean up the table. I didn't stick around for an assignment. This was not the time to be in the way. And besides, I now had a whole evening and night ruined, worrying about the next morning's visit to the vet. This little effort of mine, I thought, has been a disaster in more ways than one. Chapter 9 All the world that ends well, almost. Looking back on that night, I remember thinking that this whole mess could never be resolved happily. What would become of Bonica, what would become of Bonicola, my new friend, who was suffering from certain starvation? And what about Chester, my older friend who seemed to have flipped his lead and if you will pardon the expression, was in the doghouse with the mourners. A far greater concern at that time, of course, was my own future. For on that night, all that consumed my thought was the fear of the next day's injections. It all seemed hopeless indeed, but looking back on the next day, I can tell you that happy endings are possible. Even in situations as fraught with complications as this one was, only the next morning, we all piled into the car. Some of us with greater reluctance than others, then trumbled up to the bed, and by afternoon, we were on our way to solving our problems. The vet worked everything out very nicely. He discovered that Panicola was suffering from extreme hunger. I could have told him that. Rather than draw his friends or stomach with the solid foods, the doctor decided he should be put on a liquid diet until he got better. So Bonicola was immediately given some carrot juice, which he drank eagerly. After he finished, he looked over at me with a great grin on his face and winked. Chatter was diagnosed as being emotionally overwrought. It was suggested that he started sessions with a cat psychiatrist to work out what the doctor called a case of sibling rivalry with Bonicola. 
I asked the chatter later what a sibling was, but he wasn't speaking to me. So I looked it up. It's like a brother or a sister. And sibling rivalry means you're competing with your brother or sister for attention. I was sure this was Chester's problem, but it sure explained a lot about Toby and Pete. As for me, well, I came out the best. Dr. Wasserman was all set to give me my shot when the nurse came in with my card. Wait, doctor, this dog doesn't need his shot yet. It's too soon. So I got a pat on the head and the doggy pop instead. These days, everything is back to normal in the Mona's household, almost. But Nicola liked his liquid diet so much that the Mona's have kept him on it. And oddly enough, they have been no problems with the vegetables mysteriously turning white since. Chester, of course, insists that this proves his theory. Obviously, Harold, the liquidified vegetables take the place of the vegetable juices. So Nicola has no need to go roaming anymore. Then he's not a vampire, I said. Nonsense, he's a vampire, all right, but he's a modern vampire. He gets his juices from a blender. Case closed, Sherlock? I queried. Case closed. Oh, Chester. Yes, Harold, what are those two funny marks on your neck? Chester chomped, and I laughed. Very funny, he said, as he began to bait his tail. Very funny. The Monroe never knew anything of Chester's theory. They changed the market, and to this they believe they were the victims of a curious vegetable blight. But Nicola and I have become good friends. He still didn't say anything, but he slot up and next to me by the fireplace and we take a long cozy snooze together. One night, I sang him a lullaby in the obscure direct of his homeland, and he slept very peacefully. It was that night that cemented our friendship. Now, about Chester. I said that everything was back to normal. Almost. Naturally, Chester is there. Almost. He has been seeing his psychiatrist, Dr. Baruch Kretz, twice a week for some time now. He takes his therapy very seriously. The other morning, I was trying to get a little sleep when, Ch when Chester came over and nudged me in the ribs. Harold, do you, realize, do you realize we were never really communicated? I mean, really communicated. I opened one eye cautiously. And in order to communicate, Harold, you have to really be in touch with yourself. Are you in touch with yourself, Harold? Can you look yourself in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I am in touch with the meanness that is me, and I can reach out to the unis that is you. I closed my eye. I'm used to it by now. He talks like that all the time. He no longer reads Edgar Allan Poe at night. And once he concluded that he had been right about the peninsula, there has been no more talk about the vampires. The mark of the vampires sits its usefulness obsolete on its shelf. Right now, he's reading Finding Yourself by Screaming a lot. And the other night, uh, when I heard the most awful noise coming from the basement, I didn't even bet, and I did. I knew it was just Chester finding himself, as he calls it. He explained to me that he's getting in touch with his kittenhood, and I've told him that's fine, just to let me know when he's going to do it, so I can be elsewhere. I've had enough trouble from Chester's adventures. So, that's my story. And the story of a mysterious stranger who no longer seems quite so mysterious and who is definitely no longer a stranger. I presented the fact as clearly as I could. And I leave it to you, dear listener, to draw your own conclusions. I must now bring this narrative to a close. Since it is a Friday night, Toby's night to stay up late and read. And I can hear the crinkling of cellophane. I can only hope it covered two chocolate cupcakes with a cream filling.